Okay, class, we're on chapter 12.2, Reconstruction and its Effects. Now, if we're going to look at this picture, this is summing up the Reconstruction period. We have former slaves on one side. We have former slave owners on the other side. Here are some of our objectives this week. Summarize the economic problems in the South. Identify differences among members of the Republican Party in the South. So we're going to have some Republican members in the South. Describe the efforts of former slaves to improve their lives. So former slaves, they're struggling right now. So we're going to sort of see what sort of things are they trying to improve. And analyze the changes in the southern economy. So we have the collapse of a southern economy. We're going to start seeing some changes so that it can hopefully rise again. So looking at the physical and economic changes, this is mostly happening in the south. So by 1870, all the Confederate states are now back in the Union, and they all have uh, Republican governments. So we're having a rise of Republicanism in the South. But many of these people in the South are now poor. And the reason is we have property ha value has plummeted because of the war was mostly in the South. This is something we've talked a little bit already about last week. The other thing is that many people invested their money in Confederate bonds. Well, those Confederate bonds, they are now worthless. They are not worth any money. So if you had invested your life savings in a bond to support the Confederacy, well, the Confederacy doesn't exist anymore. Therefore, you've lost all that money. Here's sort of an example of some of the physical conditions in the South. As you can see, there's a lot of destruction. Again, we have buildings and infrastructures, farms are completely destroyed. This is what we're dealing with in the South. We have one-fifth of white males are dead due to the Civil War. We have many are now uh, maimed, which means they are injured. As you can see, this man here, he's on crutches. He can't walk on his foot. We have tens of thousands of black males who are also dead. So just to reiterate, we have People are poorer than before, the property has now declined, and Confederate bonds, these are worthless. Again, we have some ruins. You can see a church in the background here, and a boy sitting amongst the ruins in the south. Now, as a way to boost economy in the south, we have a lot of public works programs. Now, what this includes is um, trying to build transportation. So this is going to be things like railways. Now remember, a lot of those generals, they destroyed all the railways in the south. Well, now they need to rebuild them in order for them to sort of have um, import and export trading going on in the south. We also have many homes for orphans built, so many children are left without parents after the Civil War. We have homes for the disabled, so many of the men who have, um, uh, are disabled after the war as well. And we also have the first public schools being built in the South as well. Now, at this point, many um, states in the North, they already have public schools. But to the South, this was actually a new concept, having a public school where everyone can go and get educated. The problem starts to come, though, is that these are all expensive things. So the South, they don't have money. Remember, they are poor right now. They can't really afford to build up transportation and public schools. The North, they are not necessarily that excited to invest in the South either. I mean, they just had a war with the South. They're, they're not going to be jumping around trying to invest there. So what ends up happening is a lot of states, they end up raising their taxes. So many of the people who are already in poverty are now being taxed even more on what little they have to try and get these programs up and running. What's happening politically at this time is we also have a lot of turmoil in the South as well. And we have these two sort of terms that come out during this time. One is a scallywag. Now a, sa a scallywag is a southerner who is a Republican. Now if you remember, Southerners were mostly Democrats at this time, and the reason was Republicans were very anti-slavery. Well, now after the war, we have some Southerners rising up, and they believe that the Republican Party is the only way that Southern economy will get better. These are going to be small farmers, so not the plantation owners, but someone who has a small farm. 
and they're tr they're joining the Republicans to try and um, get their businesses up and running again. Now, many of the Democrats, they use the word scallywag as a negative term. They're sort of accusing these men of um, going against sort of the morals of the South. We also have another negative term called the carpetbaggers. The carpetbaggers are northern Republicans who come to the South. Now, the reason they're called carpetbaggers is Democrats in the South believe that they were going to take advantage of the South's turmoil and political chaos. And many of them only came with one single bag from the North. They didn't really have a lot of belongings. Now at this time we have the 15th Amendment. This is giving the vote to African American men. This is actually an exciting time for African American men. They are the largest group of Southern Republicans. So if you imagine um, looking at the population in the South, we have 30 to 50 percent of um, African Americans can now vote. They make up a large percentage of the population. So in many areas, 90 percent of African American voters vote in their first election. So we have anyone who wants to vote is going to vote. They think this is an important right and they're showing that they are going to use it. But we have some political differences. So with the further gaining of civil rights for African Americans in the South, it's not going to come with very easily. First of all, the Republican Party, which has a majority black support, they are trying to gain more white support in the South. So what they do is they appoint um, they appoint former white Democrats to be the leaders of the Republican Party in the South. This backfires. The Southerners don't really go and vote for Republicans because of this. The second thing is it sort of makes a lot of the African Americans feel a little um, rejected by the Republican Party. The other thing is that we have an attitude. There is an attitude in the South. Many white people, even though slavery is gone, have not really accepted that African Americans have rights. And so they don't really change their attitudes towards African Americans. Many refuse to even accept African American status. While some do support African American status, some people believe that the support came to gain political power. So this would be those scallywags. Some people believe scallywags were just uh, in the Republican Party to gain power in government, not because they actually um, believed what they were doing. Many African Americans, they were a little bit worried about their newfound freedom. First of all, they, were, they almost hadn't believed that it had happened. The second thing is that they don't have any land. They have no tools, they have no money. During slavery, they at least had a place to live and was given a little bit of food. Now, they're sort of thinking, where are we going to live? We could live anywhere. How are we going to survive? So we have sort of a mass migration of African Americans throughout the South. So first former slaves are very cautious about this freedom. As you can see, these are actually uh, many African Americans on the move. So many are traveling to new places. They basically, they want to leave anything that's associated with their former plantation life. If you imagine suffering under slavery for years, being treated horribly by your master, you're not going to really want to stay in that place. So many people are leaving. And where do many of these people leave? They go to the major southern cities. So we have southern cities are booming with African American workers and they're all going to look for new opportunities. We also have the reunification of families. So if you imagine that during um, slavery many people were broken apart. So husbands and wives were sold to different plantations. We have children are sold off to different plantations. What's happening now is we have more pe many of these African Americans are going to look and be reunited with their families. So here's an example of an African American family being reunited after years of being separated from on different plantations. 
The other thing is we have couples, they can actually marry together and know that they are going to be keeping their children. Up until this point, slave masters would sell off um, many of these slaves' children to different plantations and make money off of them. That, of course, is no longer going to happen. The other thing is we start seeing um, a rise in education. So all freed people, they had a right to seek education. So here we see a, slow, a slight dip in education for whites, but here we have education for black and other races is going from zero to 30%. So we have 30% of the African American population going to schools. So during this time, we see a lot of school, African American schools established. Most teachers were northern whites, but by 1969, most of the teachers are black. So we see that this education is working. In the South, though, we do have some violence um, acting out against the education of African Americans. They believe, they still have a belief that African Americans are below white and they don't really deserve to be educated. So here's an example of an African American school in the South. Here we are too. We also see that there are African American churches. Up until this point, slaves were forced to go to their master's churches, which were white preachers. But now they have a chance to build their own churches. And many of them go to Baptist and Methodist churches. We also have ministers becoming community leaders for African Americans. And we have thousands of volunteer organizations, so things like giving financial aid, emotional support, and leadership opportunities to African Americans. We also start to see the African Americans in politics. So we have, they end up holding local, state, and federal offices, and many people, and some African Americans are elected into those government offices. So by 1867, we have some former slaves are actually having political roles. The other thing is um, we have almost as many black as white citizens, and therefore black office holders, although they're the minority, we start to actually see some um, voice for African Americans in politics as well. Hiram Revels, he ends up being the, our first African-American senator in Congress. The backlash to this is we do start to see some discrimination laws in the South. This, these are segregation laws. So in 1866, Republican governments, they repeal most of those black codes that we discussed last week. We have anti-segregation laws, although many of them are not enforced. So what this means is black and white have to go to separate schools. They have to go to separate bathrooms. That is the sort of thing. But the African Americans, they're mostly focused on building up their own community. So they don't necessarily want to be integrated with whites. They kind of want to be left alone after being under slave rule for so long. During the Civil War, we had General Sherman. He's pr uh, promising many former slaves that if they help with Sherman's march, that they're going to actually gain land after the war. So many of these freed slaves, they settled on land that has been abandoned. No one's using it. But Johnson eventually evicts these freed slaves off of this land, saying that it belongs back to those original plantation owners. Many Republicans, they reject this idea of seizing property from the freed slaves. And they pass sort of these weak land reform laws. The last thing is we have a restoration of plantations. So African Americans and poor whites, they want small farms. But we have northern merchants and sort of rich planters, they want to bring back um, plantation. That's sort of this idea of cash crops. But planters, they sort of fear that they will be able to, won't be able to make a profit because now they must pay these people who they were their former slaves. We have many free men are also working in mills, railroads, and farming. All of these are sort of jobs that develop. We also have share crop cropping. Share cropping are landless African Americans. They are signing labor contracts with planters. So they are neither freedmen nor planters. Uh, so neither of them are really happy with this system. 
Lastly, we have the death of the cash crop of cotton. So it's no longer as necessary as before. Your question this week, how is the southern economy weakened after the Civil War?